today's video we're going to install something that I've been waiting a while for. I ordered this kit about a month ago. This angle kit is going to be the FDF Mantis kit. It seems to be the go-to kit for a lot of people with Corvettes and 350Zs. They also make other kits for 240s and S550 Mustangs and a bunch of other applications. But their kit for the S197 seems to be really nice. I was on the fence for a while about which kit to even get. You can get the Drift Knuckles kit which seems to be decent. And then Matt Sopa from Formula D fame. He has a company called Make It Modular and his kit is really nice also. But I went with the FDF kit because I discovered a channel recently called Drift Games. They're a group of guys out of Ireland and Dave from Drift Games has an S197 that used to be one of Von Gittin Jr.'s old drift cars. A few months ago, they installed the FDF Mantis kit on that S197 and it seemed to make a really big difference on his car. It's a different car. So after watching that video, I was pretty much convinced that I had to have the FDF Mantis. So I'm gonna go through, try to give you some tips on how to install install this, show you the whole process, talk a little bit about my car, and also do a quick unboxing. Normally I take parts to the garage, but this kit looks so good that I need to unbox it and do some beauty shots. This is a really awesome looking kit. Now all I gotta do is put all this stuff on and hopefully we can get this thing on before the next event. So let's get started on this and I'll try to give you guys some pointers as we go. A lot of the bolts are gonna be where they need to be. That's a really good touch to put all the hardware on the arms and spindles. Gets rid of a lot of the guesswork. But one of my biggest disappointments with this whole kit is that it didn't come with any FDF stickers. So let's pack this all back up and uh, try not to scratch it up and we'll take it to the garage. So to get a good idea of how much angle we're going to gain, we're going to go ahead and go full lock and put some tape down. Also did this in the video when we removed the rack limiters to show how much we gained then. It was actually a pretty good amount, but this time we should gain even more and we should also get a bit of Ackerman correction. Seems like the steering geometry on these Mustangs, the outer wheel winds up not taking on as much angle as the inner wheel, so this should correct some of that. We're going to go ahead and verify that by just putting some tape down and seeing what we get. Not really a bad amount of angle. There's actually a little bit more angle than this left in the steering, but the steering wheel winds up self-correcting just a little bit under full lock. But we're gonna go ahead and put some tape down anyway. All right, now that we got some tape down, we're gonna go ahead and jack the car up and get started. But first, I think I'm gonna take the fender flares off and the bumper just for a little more access. It should make this a little bit easier. If you're doing this on a car with uncut fenders, it's not really gonna be that big of a deal to just leave the fenders on. You should be fine. We got the car up pretty high, we should be good to go there. Right now, as you can see, it takes a lot of turns to get to full lock. The steering is pretty slow. Sounds like something's binding. So hopefully this quickens up a bit. It should be good right there. 
The car is currently on spacers because of the RTR fender flares. I've been riding on spacers for over five years and I've never had a wheel fall off or a spacer break or anything. Knock on wood. A lot of people say spacers are dangerous, but really if you clean up everything right and put a little bit of blue Loctite on the lugs, you're fine. But with the angle kit, it's going to space out the track width quite a bit. I'm not sure how much it's going to space out. So with the 1552s being a plus 45, I think it's going to give us a lot more wiggle room to space out or take the spacer off completely but we're gonna pull them off for now anyway pretty much the entire hub assembly has to come out and the coilover has to come out they are a little more rusty than I thought they would be hopefully the end links don't snap or something stupid you can find end links pretty easy though the springs are a little messed up maybe someday I'll get some sponsorship through a suspension company and change these out but once you have all this out of the way you're gonna want to take the lower control arm off and the sway bar might have to possibly come out I'm not quite sure on that yet. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. With my Fox Body Angle Kit, I was not running a sway bar, but I was running some really stiff front springs. You can rebuild these with some stiffer springs. I can't let this thing sit on jack stands for too long because we need to get to the skyline for something important. We're gonna try to do this without breaking anything and Hopefully, if we do need to get rid of the sway bar, it doesn't make the front too like squishy. So let's start on this side and see how it goes. I'm taking the brake line off of the front caliper because that should have been done before. I wanted to try to get away with not bleeding the brakes, but I wanted to put a lot of tension on the rubber line going to the caliper if you don't take it off. So I wound up dropping it. It didn't break anything, but I'm just gonna bleed the brakes after all this is done. Once you break this line, you don't want brake fluid all over your garage floor or all over the metal, so I used a glove. You can use a bunch of towels or like a baggie or something like that if you want, and that'll keep this leakage to a minimum as long as your glove doesn't have a hole in it. You're also going to have to get rid of the ABS sensor that's down here. It should just be one little bolt here and you can take this whole thing apart. There was a quick connect on the other side of the speed or ABS sensor so that comes off pretty easy. I'm not sure if the new setup's going to have a speed sensor hole or not. This car has the ABS deleted so I'm not really worried about that. So one thing that you might need with this kit is a new front hub assembly. These front hubs are pretty old but I'm going to be hard headed and I hate to admit this, but we're going to reuse these front hubs. It's one of those things like it's not broken. It's not making noise. There's no play in it. And uh, the budget's already tight enough as it is. Please watch all my videos so I can get more ad revenue and be able to afford front hubs. 36 mil. That's loud. Now that the dust shield's out of the way, you can get to the spindle bolts a little bit easier. You're gonna need an 18 millimeter socket to bust these loose. They're usually torqued on pretty good. If you're doing this on your car, you probably got coilovers. If you're putting on a fresh set, you can just go ahead and demo this whole thing in one assembly, but we're gonna reuse these front coilovers, so we gotta get the spindle out and that lower control arm and also this tie rod and link. Let's keep your nuts and bolts together for future assembly. So we're gonna reuse those. Probably won't need this again, but we're gonna keep it anyway, just in case we ever wanna take this car back to stock. Our glove's pretty much full of brake fluid, so we're gonna change this out. I did just buy a Harbor Freight Creeper, because I think I've reached a point where I'm tired of sliding around on cardboard. It's just too old for this. Once you get this boot off, you can basically turn the wheel by pushing the rack inside of itself to get the wheel to turn the opposite way. Make sure your ignition is unlocked, that way the steering wheel is not locked. And you can kind of just kick the wheel out while you're under here. That takes that inner tie rod and pushes it inside the rack. 
So now with the big part of it out of the way, you can reach that front bolt on the lower control arm. Pretty easy. And you think it's gonna be an 18? So here we have the stock lower control arm. This one's nice and rusty because of all my daily driving and driving this thing in the winter and also taking it on the Bonneville Salt Flats a couple years ago. That probably all contributed to this amount of rust. Really need to move away from the East Coast for the sake of my vehicles. Anyway, some angle kits are gonna have an extended lower control arm where they just cut the factory one and extend it out a couple inches. A couple years ago, Leo did some extended lower control arms to get more negative camber on his car, which was terrible. Those came from Drift Knuckles, I think, and that was just the cut factory one. The FDF arm is gonna be a completely new piece, so I'm pretty excited about that. It should fit a lot better, look a lot better. On the end links on the BCs, at least, it's a T40 for the inner. You can see that these end links were actually a little loose. Not sure why. And also the guy that I got these from kind of stripped these out a little bit. When I got them, a lot of the hardware was already stripped. All right, so this end link was rusty enough that it got stripped out. So if you got rusty end links, maybe just buy new ones. That sucks. All right, now we can go ahead and get our coilover out and continue on. Get them close to being out, but not out. I'm gonna put these nuts on the top hat again, just for safekeeping. We need some camber plates in the future. It's one of those Diablo, like, heavy metal blades. This thing works really well. They're pretty expensive, though, but uh, it's nice to have these on tap, honestly. Got a lot of stuff with these blades. So this side is done. I made a complete mess, but all the tools are still out, and we're gonna go ahead and move to the other side before we start doing our drilling and everything. Got some nice, refreshing summer shandies on tap. So now I'm rejuvenated and we're gonna go ahead and do a speed round on trying to get all this off. side is off now and I think I'm gonna go home for a little bit need to do some research on if the sway bar is even needed on this setup I think drift games had some issues with theirs and they weren't running one not sure if they put one on I might need longer in lengths than the BC ones, so the factory ones might actually wind up working I think I have a set of those laying around somewhere but yeah all in all this side wasn't too bad it's just a matter of trying to figure out how to get things off you said these rear bolts they're a little bit of a pain. Most of my tools come from Harbor Freight because I'm poor, but if you take that long 21 millimeter wrench that I have and then take another big wrench on that and kind of use it as like a cheater wrench, it's enough torque to get these off because you can't really get a breaker bar in there. So the wrench on wrench action winds up working pretty good. And then, like I said, the trick with that front is to pull the rack in and then you can get to that bolt and get that bolt out. And uh, yeah, still need to get a hole saw for the holes for the strut towers. I think I have one that might work. We did a little quick mock-up on this. We're gonna look at this tomorrow though. We pretty much got our sides sorted out. So that arm and that spindle are gonna go on the driver's side. And uh, this, I don't know, still gotta figure that part out. This also comes with some plates to correct Ackerman. No mounts for a dust shield on the spindles and no mounts for a speed sensor. So we can't even run that anyway. We'll finish this up tomorrow. Did a mock up of the caster camber plates. They're so good looking and it sucks that they gotta be hidden under here. Looks like the hole from the factory for the coilovers is gonna be in a good spot to actually be a pilot hole. Looks like it could be out a little bit more, but it's in a pretty good spot to be a pilot hole. So we're gonna go ahead and drill that out and then try to notch this going that way just for more adjustability and accessibility. This metal was really tough though. We tried to notch out the same metal on Leo's car and it didn't go very well. We were 
trying to get a little bit of camber taken out of his when he had airlift and it did not work out very well. I have better cutting saws and grinders and stuff now, so I think we have the technology to do this. Let's see underneath. When you're doing any kind of cutting, just, you know, protect all this. You don't want metal and stuff flying around. Also grinding sparks, some people say, oh, they don't hurt, but it'll put little specks in your windshield. So make sure you protect that too. We're gonna take these out and start drilling a hole. As for a hole saw, this is gonna be an inch and three quarter hole saw. Gonna actually be a little overkill in all honesty. Could probably do uh, like an inch and three eighths, which I probably have one laying around somewhere, but so with an inch and three quarter hole saw, I would kind of cover this entire spot right here and then we could just notch it out that way. Probably won't be able to reach these screws here to get a little more camber taken out if we want. We're just gonna leave it in the factory position. But you can see with this plate design, you can actually slide it around and that's gonna add caster and camber depending on which way this actually spins. So basically, you can spin your strut out in kind of a circular fashion and actually take a little bit of caster out. If you spin it this way, it's gonna take a little bit of camber out, add a little bit of caster. Let's see if we can get this whole saw to fit in that actual spot. I might go in there pretty good like that. And then we'll take the grinder and cut it out a little bit more. Make sure you wear eye protection. Just you only got one set of eyes and stuff. I had a dollar for every time I cut up this car. We probably afford a case of beer at this point. <laughs> eh, not bad. I have to grind this out a little bit more, but you get the gist of it. See right now the strut would be perfectly in line with our slit that we cut. Only thing I'm concerned about is if we go to add even more caster. I think if we spin it, it's gonna wind up hitting this spot right here. So maxed out, we would be fine if we're taking as much caster out as we possibly can. But if we wanna add more, I think, I think we'd have to wind up making this bigger. So I hate to do this, but I'm gonna cut another slit because I don't want this to interfere when we're on the alignment rack. It would be a big deal to have to cut this thing out while I'm on the alignment rack, so I'm gonna try my best to try to notch this out, and uh, that shouldn't affect the support or anything of this strut tower. You're still gonna have those three points of contact here, which is basically support and everything. And this is really thick metal. You can see how thick it is. This might not be a step that you have to do, but we're gonna go ahead and add a little bit of a cut here and then try to radius this out. So basically where this hump is on this piece of metal, we're gonna slice there and then try to get some sort of a decent looking cut there. So this is a lot of metal cut out. If I would have drilled it a little bit further back, I probably could have saved a little bit of it. But really a sixteenth of an inch of extra metal is not gonna make that big of a difference. This is gonna give me all the caster and camber adjustment I can possibly get out of those plates. So if you buy this kit, you can probably expect to chop off this much. Probably could have took just a little more off. So all your pressure is gonna be going towards these three points anyway. And that plate's pretty big. I don't know if it's made out of billet or what it's made out of, but pretty much all your force is gonna go on this plate and then be dispersed on these three bolts here. So it should be fine. I don't expect the strut towers to cave in or anything anytime soon. We're gonna, we're gonna clean this up a little bit more, file it down, that way whoever aligns this doesn't get cut. And then we're gonna paint it, make it look a little bit nicer. And also painting it is gonna make it where it doesn't rust. We're just gonna rattle can it, try to section this off as just like the top piece and then it shouldn't look too, too bad. Not that I pop my hood much anyway. This isn't a show car. This is my car. Right, let's do the same thing with this virgin side. I could probably get away with cutting a little bit less on this side, but because we did that side already, we're gonna do the same exact thing over here, just for symmetry. So 
mean, you gotta replace the top plates on your coilovers. One big thing is to make sure that there's no preload on the spring. Make sure that this spins freely. Because if you take these two nuts off, the hat could potentially just shoot out and kill you. So just make sure that that's nice and loose when you go to do this. While these are all out, I kind of wish I would have ordered some new springs, but whatever, maybe later. Looks like the top nut is gonna be a 17. Uh, well, I guess mine are mismatched from side to side. It's a word of advice, I don't know if I said this earlier, but if you're buying BC coilovers, don't buy them used. Don't trade your air suspension to a guy for these because they're gonna suck. So this side's 19, the other side is something else, so I don't know why, but let's bust these loose. And then this is 17, you're gonna wanna take an Allen wrench, throw it in there. That Allen wrench is gonna be a five millimeter. Looks like this nut is actually part of the bearing, so don't lose this. You see that is BC's bearing. Uh, you might want to clean this up, put a little bit of fresh grease on there too, just because. And then the FDF caster camber plate is going to go right where that factory BC plate went. Just a little bit of grease. I don't even know if that's necessary, but I like to grease everything. Everything feels a little bit better with lube. If your coilovers came with an extra little lock nut, throw that on top too. I'm gonna torque this down to a couple ee-ee's. Make sure it doesn't bust loose. And that bearing should spin pretty freely. And, uh, move around a bit. And this is ready to go. So these pieces are gonna go to the inner tie rods. This package also includes the Ackerman correction plates. You can bump the Ackerman out or take the Ackerman in. These plates would replace the plates that space out where the tie rod is gonna connect. Right now we're gonna keep the plates that are kind of centered and go with that and see how that works out. I'm gonna take this thing to the alignment shop. We're probably not gonna mess with Ackerman at all. This also has some limiters built into the spindle and we're gonna leave those in for now too. See how much angle we get with them and see how much angle we get without. But we're gonna go ahead and throw the arm on finally. And I feel like this is when it's gonna become real. Once we get this in, then we'll do the spindle and yeah, see how it goes. And the arm is gonna be positioned like this so that your tire, when you're going to full lock, can kind of tuck in to this arm here. This joint is gonna go in that channel on your K-member where the factory one went. This one is gonna go into this thing, which this actually might be the passenger side. I don't have that figured out yet. But basically, this threaded part is gonna go in this heim joint. And then your spindle will go onto the end of this. It's actually gonna have to spin out a bit for the clearance for the K-member. So this one that is shaped like this is gonna be for the passenger side. You can buy new bolts for this. But we're gonna go ahead and use the factory stuff. I'm gonna keep everything loose for now because we don't know how much we're gonna to have to adjust certain things. I think we might have to extend this joint out a little bit. But let's go ahead and put the coil over in just so we have something to mount the spindle to and uh, see how this looks. We can adjust this point a little bit once we have everything together. Because we left everything loose, it's easy enough to take that bolt out and spin the heim joint out a little bit. So this is gonna be the adapter for the inner tie rod to the spindle. So it's gonna be different sizes on either side. I'm gonna go ahead and take the smaller side, and screw that onto the inner tie rod. Make sure you don't cross thread it. We're gonna go ahead and bottom it out just for now. Then you're gonna to wanna to take the heim joint off of the spindle. It was nice of them to include it on. But, uh, we're gonna go ahead and take it off. <laughs> go ahead and screw this on the other side of that adapter. This is gonna be reverse threaded. That way when you're doing your adjustment for your toe in and toe out, you can turn the adapter and kind of push it out. So lefty tighty. We are gonna adjust this after everything's put in, just so we can get to the alignment shop. I don't own any kind of tow vehicle, so we wanna get this as close to straight as we can. Feels like it's bottoming out right around there, so we're gonna stop. Go ahead and bolt our spindle onto the strut first. We're gonna go ahead and throw the pushings back in our tie rod in link. 
whatever you would like to call it. Fresh hive joints are really hard to manipulate sometimes, so if you take the bowl and kind of straighten it that way, you can sometimes do it, sometimes not. Mm -hmm. For the lower control arm, it's gonna be kind of the same situation. You're gonna to wanna to take the heim joint off of the spindle and then screw that into the end of the lower control arm. Makes the assembly a lot easier. I'm gonna leave a little bit of thread out just because. It'll give us a little bit of clearance. I'm not sure how we're gonna to have to adjust this yet. Just leave a couple out. Throw that onto the spindle. Don't forget these bushings for the heim joints. Everything's still loose and nothing's adjusted to where it needs to be, but you can see already this angle is going to be ridiculous. You can definitely see that there's a lot more caster, which is good. Uh, this car needs more caster. I feel like there's no, there's no self steer and no steering feeling because there's no caster. That's part of the issue I think with this car steering very badly, so with a little more caster gonna be pretty nice I think. So I think I'm gonna throw the hub on real quick just to do a little test fit and see how this looks with a wheel on it. So it's spinning and not hitting the coilover so that's a good sign. Let's go ahead and see what kind of angle we can get when we push it in. So this obviously isn't going to be the final angle, but you can see what we started with versus what we got now. That's pretty ridiculous. If we can keep it somewhere around here, that'll be ridiculous. <laughs> we still got to extend out the tie rod and everything and make sure that that's set, like, centered. If we can keep it close to that, that would be stupid. Look at all that room for activities. Ah, let's see what we got when we push it back this way. So at full lock this way, you can see that the wheel is super close to where the sway bar is gonna be. So I'm not sure if this is gonna work with a sway bar. That's also with the limiters hitting the lower control arm. So if that was taken out, we could go even more, but then it's gonna hit the sway bar. That's pretty awesome though. Imagine full lock making all the coyote noises. Since we're gonna keep the Ackerman plates in the stock position, we're gonna go ahead and tighten these up and then uh, try to get some of this stuff squared away. Placed an order through Napa for some inner tie rods because we wound up stripping these out pretty bad and I'm not going to be able to adjust the toe to where it needs to go so we're going to finish up the other side as much as we can and then come back to this tomorrow I guess if they come in. So yeah thanks Napa for having a mislabeled website you bastards. But yeah so far it's looking good. Guess we'll finish it up tomorrow. So we got two new inner tie rods because I stripped those out. Also wound up getting the hub nuts because they're supposed to be one time use only. We're gonna throw these on, get the hub nice and tight. I'm supposed to torque these to like 250 foot pounds or something, but I don't have a torque wrench that goes that high. So we're just gonna take our impact and put it on setting three and give it a bunch of ugga duggas and it should be fine. From what I've read, any kind of Ford tech at any dealership is just gonna put an impact on these anyway. So so that's all we're gonna do. If your inner tie rods are locked up like mine, you need to buy some new ones. This is what the new ones look like. Comes with a new nut so you can 
get this thing locked in nice and tight. But basically just unscrew it and unscrew the new one in. I don't know what size wrench that's supposed to be. I think they make a special tool for it. I used the pipe wrench last time when I did the steering rack. So we're gonna use a pipe wrench again for this. That worked out pretty good and I got it nice and snug. Looks like it's pre-greased. So that's cool too. It even comes with a little bit of extra grease. So we're gonna go ahead and throw these in. Probably not gonna record that because it's so tight under there. We'll do that and then get back to the rest of the install. So I started fitting up the brake caliper. The flange on the FDF spindles is different than the factory one. The factory one's about... Listen to those things. The flange on the FDF spindle is about a quarter of an inch skinnier than the factory spindle. So when you go to throw in your caliper bolts, they're going to be long enough that they hit the brake rotor. So what you want to do is either space these out about 3 sixteenths to a quarter of an inch, or you can cut about 3 sixteenths worth of threads off of the factory bolts. But that's what I'm going to do. There was enough space to where you could take a nut and just kind of space it out, but uh, we're just going to cut them down because I want to reuse these factory bolts. If you do cut the factory bolts, just make sure you follow down the threads on the tip nice and smooth. You really don't want to mess up the threads in your caliper or you're going to need a new caliper. Down about 3 Might even want to chase it with a nut just to make sure that your threads are smooth. Like I said, you really don't want to cross thread those calipers. Maybe check it in the caliper just to make sure. And then torque these down to a lot. Might even want to put a little bit of blue thread locker on there. Another thing with the brakes that I noticed is if we mount this bracket in its factory location, we're going to have so much angle that the rubber line is actually going to stretch now. Yesterday when I was tugging around on the brake lines, for some reason this one just kind of broke out of uh, whatever the hell was holding it on. So the thing what we're going to do is use this factory little hole right here. I'm not sure what this hole was for originally, probably for some of the inner fender liners. So we're going to just throw that little ear it's on the bracket into that hole and then take a self-tapping screw and hold the bracket that way. And that should give us enough play to where we can go full lock and not destroy the brake line. It's close, but it should be fine. Put a little more bend in this one. Make sure you don't break any of them. Hopefully we can do that for the driver's side too. Seemed like tech screwing that bracket to the frame worked out pretty good. Kind of wish I would have put it a little bit lower. We got the brake lines tight. Everything is kind of secure. All the bolts are tight. All the nuts are tight. We're going to do one last little angle check just to make sure nothing is binding up. And then we're going to bleed the brakes. And then we're going to try to get the alignment a little closer. To adjust toe, all you do is spin this. It's just like the factory setup on the outer tie rods. You just spin it and because this is reverse threaded, it pushes the front of the wheel out or in, depending on which way you spin it. So we got this loose right now. We're gonna see how much angle we got locked to lock. Make sure nothing's binding up one more time before we bleed the brakes. And then, put some wheels on it. Seems like everything is pretty solid. Let me see around how much angle we've gained so far, which is a lot. Once we put a wheel on it, you'll really be able to see it. For bleeding the brakes on our own, we're gonna use the Harbor Freight Bleeder Kit. It's like a vacuum thing. Probably not gonna film that because brake fluid is really bad for plastics and metals, and I really like this camera that I'm using right now. So I'll see you after we bleed the brakes. Let's try a wheel and see if anything's binding up. Places of concern are gonna be the brake lines. We already checked that out, but we just need to make sure the tire doesn't hit. Also gotta make sure we don't hit that harness that's on the outside of the frame rail. That sticks out a little bit. It shouldn't hit, but we need to make sure. In case anybody from a foreign land wants to know what a cicada looks like. That's for all that noise is in the background. Need them to get out of here. I don't, I don't like bugs, but I don't want to kill them. I like puppy bugs. Oh, go. Shoot! Shoot! Go away! Dog, you're gonna get killed by the tire. Go, go outside! Anyway. Kinda hard to see in here with this crappy lighting. 
It's actually hitting the sway bar a little. It looks like it's just enough that it's hitting a wheel on full lock. So even if I could get the end links to work, I don't think I can run a sway bar with this kit. I just don't see the end links working with this. So that's one issue I might have to ask somebody about. It might be for another episode because we really got to get this done and out of the garage today. The sway bar is an issue on this kit. It kind of is on a lot of big angle kits. My Fox Body kit, I couldn't run the sway bar with that either. We'll look into that a little bit and maybe on the update video, I'll let you know. I don't want him to get hurt because I'm a nice guy like that. Go away. Go to the woods. Really didn't want to do it, but I took the sway bar out. It's not really going to help me out with not having end links. And it's just going to potentially rub the tire and explode and kill me. We just took it out for the time being. It's pretty easy to do. All you got to do is take this brace out from underneath the K-member and the front radiator support. Take that down and you can loosen it up. It's all 15 millimeter. It's pretty quick. As long as you got an impact or one of these electric ratchets. We used our iPhone level to kind of check the caster and it's close, but because the alignment shop's pretty close, the only real adjustment that we're going to worry about is toe. So to do that, we're going to take a jack stand and basically take some string and try to square up the front wheels with the back wheels. You can see that the front wheels are pushed out a little bit beyond the back wheels now. We're also going to do this on the ground. You're supposed to do it while it has load on it. And hopefully we don't have to adjust the coilovers up too much because I locked those down already. But we might have to, depending on how slammed this is. And hopefully it doesn't ride like complete garbage without the sway bar. But we'll find that out too. Before I take it down now, we're going to eyeball it up against where the original tape line was. Because I think when I put it down and start steering, it's just going to rip the tape up. As you can see, it's quite a bit different. It's uh, a lot more angle. And that's the outside wheel. The inside wheel, you can see it's a whole different angle. We could even get a little more angle if we took those limiters out, which I might actually do real quick just for, you know, just for the tube. Now the limiters are taken out and it's just crazy. Maybe I'll leave them out. I mean, I paid for all the angle. So maybe I should use all the angle. All right, uh, let's get the toe set and then maybe we can do some pictures and stuff. I like to film every time I put a car on or off jack stands because I dropped one before and I guess it would make for good content if I do drop one. For our next problem, we are a little bit too low so we're gonna raise the car up, I don't know, about an inch, maybe more. I don't want to get too high, but you can see that it's hitting the flare. We'll go for like an inch and a half. It would probably look good once the front bumper's on, but uh, I don't want to rub these flares. Like I said, they're rare. There's only like two sets of these flares that I know of, and I have both of those. Let's take it up a bit. With our alignment, what we did was took a piece of jet line and we're just going to square it up to the back wheel. Pretty sure there's a few videos on this by now, but this is how I did the alignment on the Volvo wagon. Some people actually take string and just wrap it around the wheel and they'll just pull the string flat across the back wheel and then line it up that way. But because our track width up front is going to be pretty wide, we're going to space this out with the jack stands. So we're going to take a tape measure, measure from the back of the wheel to the string and the front of the wheel to the string. And once that measurement's the same, then we can square it up up here. Another thing is to make sure that it's kind of close to the center of the hub. This is just going to be to get us to the alignment rack next week. Try to get as close to the center of the hub as possible. That way you don't have to worry about any of the camber or anything messing with your measurements. But once you get all of that square, you just adjust your toe with that and then lock it in with the two lock nuts and then do the same thing to the other side. Try to get your steering wheel as centered as possible when you're doing this too. That way your steering wheel is not like tilted to the left or the right too much. And uh, once we do that, we can take it for a test drive finally. A very short test drive because it's not really going to be completely aligned. So we're not going to do anything too stupid today. Plus it's Friday and there's a lot of traffic out so we don't want to do anything crazy. Wanted to get this done the other day but I went to a wedding yesterday. And Wednesday night, Amanda went and looked at something that I'll talk about in a future video that's pretty exciting. So, uh, yeah, stay tuned for that. But anyway, let's do this and 
go for a ride. And we might actually put the fender flares on, but I think I'm gonna leave the bumper off for now because we need to be able to get on the alignment rack. And that front splitter on my bumper is just really big and likes to get torn up and hit stuff. Now we got this squared up. It's about four and seven eighths from the string to the back of the wheel. And then from the front of the wheel, we got about the same. So now that we have that, we know that this is square because we have a solid axle car. I guess I should also mention that if you have an independent rear, this isn't gonna work because independent rears can sometimes tow in and out, at least on the Skyline because you have the Hikus. Some independent rears, you can't even do a tow adjustment, but on the Skyline you can, so keep that in mind. If you do have a Skyline or an S13 or something that had Hikus or any kind of tow adjustment, you really can't do this method unless you know that your tow is really solid on the rear. So now we can measure the front and we got two and a quarter light to the front and then two and a half heavy. So right now we need to be able to tow this out a bit. It's towed in. So keep in mind that a couple threads on your tie rod adjustment is gonna be a lot. So check it often. You should also do this under load because like I said, when you jack it up, it is gonna move around a little bit. So yeah, let's adjust it and adjust it again and again and again and again. This is kind of a lengthy process to do it this way. Just paying somebody a hundred or 200 bucks is just a way better way to align your car. Another important thing is to check your steering wheel because mine moved on its own because I didn't take the keys out of the ignition and lock the steering wheel. So the steering wheel started turning itself in when we were adjusting the toe. Because the boards aren't really the most slippery thing, if you had some sort of sliding plates, it's better. They make some sliding plates, but we don't have those. Do it all over again, keep measuring, and yeah. Steering wheel is straight and this is pretty square. For the drift setup, we're gonna want a little bit of toe out just to make the steering a little bit quicker. But it's pretty much dead on right now. So let's go ahead and do the same thing to the other side. Let's go ahead, hook up the battery, see what kind of angle we gained and take it outside for some pictures and some awesome B-roll. shifted a little bit from jacking it up and jacking it down you can see how much was gained on the inside wheel that's a pretty significant change I uh, don't have any kind of protractor or compass or whatever to help measures angle but it's a lot and this wheel is covering most of it I probably should have extended the tape a little bit more and like I said the car kind of shifted over a little bit anyway but you can kind of see the angle and how much was gained and it's a lot it's a pretty good amount I really want to rip on this car, but I really don't want to do anything stupid. At least not any more stupid than what I already do occasionally. So I'm really happy with this kit so far. The install was actually not as bad as I was thinking. Like I said, strut towers, cut nose is kind of invasive and kind of sucks, but whatever. If you're scared to cut on your car, you probably shouldn't be drifting anyway. The wheel fitment. I really don't have much of a problem because of the flares, but everything's supposed to fit under the stock fenders anyway, so if you have a stock car, you should be fine, I think, unless you really want that extra track width. You're probably going to have to run a skinnier front than usual. The issue with the sway bar kind of sucks. I'm not sure how that's going to feel yet. I'm definitely going to look into options for that and probably up the spring rate anyway, get some different springs on these PCs, and maybe some different coilovers altogether because I kind of feel as though the these are a little old and they should probably be replaced anyway. The other issue is that they didn't give me any stickers and I'm kind of sad about that. Just joking. Kind of. It doesn't look like you can run any kind of speed sensor with these to keep your ABS. But if you have a drift car, you don't want ABS anyway, so the speed sensors aren't going to be a big deal. It's probably going to throw some more codes on your car. With this car, I already have a bunch of lights on on my cluster, so it doesn't matter to me.
drive. Doesn't sound like anything's making noise yet. Uh, something's rubbing. Yeah, we're rubbing the flare a bit. I don't think we're rubbing it enough that it's going to destroy it. I don't think. This flare might be pulled in a little bit too much too because of the lack of the bumper. So much angle now that I feel like it'll crab walk. So that's it for the video. I'm really happy with the FDF Mantis kit. It's pretty awesome. We're gonna go get this thing aligned on Monday and then hopefully take it to the track soon where I can actually test it out. Also need to re-bleed the brakes and do some other things. But the next couple weeks are going to be mostly Skyline stuff, so unfortunately I probably won't be able to drive the car until July. And hopefully it goes awesome, so stay tuned for that. Stay tuned for the Skyline stuff too because it's going to be pretty interesting and it's going to be the biggest change to the car probably since I got it. So there's your teaser for today and yeah, I'll see you guys soon. Hopefully more frequently than it's been lately, but uh, we'll see. It's going to be a busy month. Have a fantastic day and I'll see you soon and bye bye. Goddamn cicadas for my window. I'm trying to drive. Oh god, no, oh, no. Go away! He's crawling towards my face! <laughs>